So one of the things that uh, Blackburn is uh, surely trying to get across, the idea is that uh, Cartesian dualism, the notion that there are two utterly different kinds of thing, what, what was in the, in the sort of parlance of philosophy for various reasons is called substance, two different kinds of substance or being. On the one hand, the mental, on the one hand, the physical, that reality is composed of these, these two utterly different kinds of thing, kinds of substance, kinds of being. It has a certain intuitive appeal, and I hope I've defended Descartes to some extent in his dualism. But one of the things that Blackburn surely wants to communicate is that it uh, brings huge problems in terms of uh, you know explaining things on that basis. And, and you know, one of the things that we can try to do is, is, is to figure out uh, how to bridge the gap, you know, how to bridge the gap uh, that, in at least that one question, you know, of how, how is it that um, the mental can cause the physical and the physical can cause the mental, the idea of mind-body interaction. Try to figure out how that happens, you know. Uh, another strategy is, of course, to rethink the whole thing, and that's one of the things that um, Blackburn is uh, is exploring in the, in this chapter. That it's alternatives to uh, to dualism. Uh, now, he doesn't give us full blown monisms, the idea that there's only one type of substance in the world, but he does make some suggestions. One is. Uh, the suggestion that we approach um, our understanding of mental states, sort of mental states like uh, feeling pain, uh, being angry, uh, seeing a certain color, um, having a certain subjective experience, private experience of one sort or another, that um, we reduce those the mental states to other things which are not as problematic. For instance, uh, logical behaviorism on the one hand, and then what he's, I think, in the ch in the section called the scientific model, uh, the psychophysical identi identity theory. Uh, these are these are alternatives. These are ways of really solving the problem of uh, of the mental and how the mental fits into uh, a world that we take to be a physical world um, by eliminating the mental, by by explaining away um, the strangeness. Of, of the mental and, and logical behaviorism, as I understand it, uh, is is one attempt. It's not so much uh, done by contemporary philosophers, but it's certainly a very strong theory of the mental at one point in 20th century philosophy. And that is, is what do we really mean by a mental state? For instance, being in pain, being angry, um, believing this or that. You know, presumably uh, we all have special access to our own mental states. That is, we can know uh, immediately, be aware of, know our own private, individual mental states. The problem is that we can't, we can't observe them in others. The idea is that each, each one of us has a special and exclusive relationship with his or, own, his or her own mind. Logical behaviorism is sort of dismissing that. And no one has that. Uh, and uh, we certainly don't have it with regard to other people, but, but what do we have? Well, we have observable uh, behavioral states. What does it mean for somebody to be in pain? Uh, if you observe someone in pain, you don't observe their pain, but you observe them engaging in certain behaviors, uh, making certain vocalizations like ouch, um, doing things to alleviate their pain, saying certain things, um, engaging in certain behaviors. So, so one of the ways that we can sort of dispose of the mental is to say that the mental is just those behaviors or it's the disposition to behave in, in, in those ways. Uh, and, and that sort of solves the problem because all those things, those behaviors on the part of other people are observable by us. We can, we can see them doing it. We can, we, we can verify that they're doing them. It is an attempt to do away with the mental, I believe. I mean, to say that there are no special things called mental states. There are just behaviors on the part of, uh, of, of living beings. And their so-called mental states, or their minds, or their thoughts and feelings and perceptions, just are the things that they do. Um, and this, you know, brings with it certain problems, but again, it's, it's a very interesting thing, and that is, uh, it sort of goes with the, the philosopher Wittgenstein, who's kind of behind a lot of this, I think, who said nothing is hidden. 
And that was his mo one of his mottos. That is, nothing is hidden. There's no, there's no hidden realm in which the mental goes on. That, that everything that we need to know is ob ob observable to us. And uh, if we want to know what someone's being in pain means, it, it's observable to us, both in our own behavior and the behavior of others. And that these mental states, which seem to be hidden, seem to be utterly private to those who experience them and, and only, you know, experience their own minds and only to them, that that's kind of an illusion. That the mental really just is uh, what's observable. That is not something hidden, not something utterly different from the physical. Uh, another um, method or approach that, um, that Blackburn briefly describes is uh, what he calls the scientific model or the uh, psychophysical identi identity theory. And, and that is to say that uh, mental states of different sorts, um, and you know the, the the feeling pain thing is is, is a mental state that uh, Blackburn is really leaning on pretty hard there. Uh, but say something like uh, feeling pain, that subjective, qualitative experience of what it's like to feel pain, is simply um, whatever physical processes uh, we associate with this. And, and he talks about C fibers firing and uh, the state of our um, uh, of our nervous system, or our nervous system doing certain things, that that all pain really is 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 that underlying uh, physical network or underlying uh, cause. Um, and he describes this on page seventy as a reduction of the mental to the physical. That is, there's no such thing as the mental. If we really understood the mental, what we would understand is that the mental consists entirely of, of, uh, of the physical. Uh, that is, that uh, certain physical states uh, accompany so-called mental events and can be said to cause them, uh, but also can be said to just entirely be them. That is, that uh, what is the feeling of pain? It, it's our nervous system behaving or acting in a certain way. What is it to have any mental experience. It is simply the physical uh, things uh, that we associate with it. And that's why he calls it the psychophysical identity theory. The, 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 the psychological or mental and the physical are the same thing. Uh, of course, this is a way of dealing with uh, the, the problems of dualism. And, and to say that, well, dualism is so hopelessly uh, filled with, with unanswered questions, perhaps contradictions and problems of all sorts, and it should be abandoned in favor of something else, which would, if something's not a dualism, it, it's a monism. It's, if it's not a twoism, dual, it's a, it's a oneism, mono, right? Um, now that, of course, brings with it other problems. Uh, that is, it seems to leave something out. And, and here's this, this very strange word, qualia, that uh, Blackbird brings up. <coughs> Again, on page 70, he says, opponents of the psychophysical identity theory sometimes say that you can only believe this theory at the cost of feigning permanent anesthesia. The complaint is that everything distinctively mental has been left out. The correct rebuttal to this is to ask the challenger just what he thinks he has been left out and watch him squirm on the difficulties of dualism. But there are other difficulties in front of this kind of psychophysical identity theory. And... Uh, one of them is, you know, that um, pain doesn't seem to be a physical event in, in so far as what it seems to be is a, is a mental event in the sense that if I seem to myself, no matter what my body is doing or my nervous system, if I seem to myself to be experiencing pain, then I'm experiencing pain. And it doesn't seem to be reliant upon any particular uh, configuration of my nervous system. That is, as he says, the one's own consciousness rules uh, from the subject's perspective. Anything that feels like pain is pain. Uh, that is, uh, in, in our mental life, um, it does not seem that uh, either that all of our mental states can be reduced to disposition, dispositions to observable behavior or that they can be reduced to certain physical states of our bodies. Uh, what's left out is the sort of 
how it seems to the subject, to the individual person, the so-called qualia, or raw feels. For instance, he discusses on page 68 uh, the what it's like to taste coffee. Uh, there is something that it is like for us to taste coffee, but it doesn't typically make us do anything much. Contemporary thinkers like to put this by saying that there are qualia or raw feels or sensations associated with tasting coffee, which would not be observable, right? Because they don't make us do anything. Being in pain is one of those things that typically makes us do something to get out of pain. Uh, drinking coffee or the taste of coffee or the subjective experience of the taste of coffee on the one hand seems to be something real. It's something, it, it, it's like something for the one who experiences it. On the other hand, it wouldn't be an observable uh, to, to, to others. So what seems to be left out, as he says, is the distinctively mental. But that, of course, that's kind of circular reasoning. That's the point. You can't accuse someone of, um, uh, you know, uh, you can't uh, criticize someone for getting rid of the mental when they're trying to get rid of the mental, right? I mean, as if your whole point is to get rid of the two in dualism and reduce it to a one, and if that one is the physical, then obviously you're trying to get rid of the mental. But uh, those who believe in the reality of qualia, subjective states of consciousness, would point out that that, as he says, would it just belies common sense that we would have to be permanently anesthetized to believe that and, and because if we're conscious we're conscious of our consciousness being like something you know that is not reducible uh, to a physical event or to a uh, behavior